Hey everybody, John Bellamerick here again, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about the Nephio approach. So, in the last episode, we left off right here, where we talked about uh, what what we need to do in order to what's our approach to solving the complexity that we talked about last time, and we talked about three basic um, principles: uh, a unified platform for automation, um, declarative management. Uh, and this idea of um, uh, configurations or uh, uh, declarative intent that can be cooperatively managed uh, by humans and machines. Um, so let's uh, drill a little bit in closer. What do we mean by a uniform platform for automation? Um, what we don't mean is replacing everything out there. Um, that would be impossible. Um, we would. <laughs> we, I don't think anybody would be interested in, in taking that on. There's too much out there. There's too many decades worth of, of work. What we do want is a way to manage all of those, uh, uh, all of that functionality in a uniform way. So we tend to think about things in these swim lanes. If you saw the demo video, uh, you'll see uh, this slide will be familiar to you. Um, we, we think about the infrastructure. We think about the workloads that we put on top of that infrastructure. And we think about the configuration of those workloads. Now, there's you could divide this up into more layers, but this is kind of a, at a high level what we, we have. So by infrastructure, we mean um, really the underlying physical hardware, but we might divide that up into clusters. There's sort of abstractions that we build on top of that, um, nodes in Kubernetes, uh, clusters in Kubernetes. Um, we also have the idea of, of sites um, that characterizes something within a certain geography, for, for example, and then there's infrastructure within those sites. There's network capacity, um, physical network devices, uh, things like that. Uh, the workloads themselves for Nephew are typically network functions, but they could be other edge workloads. They don't have to be network functions specifically. And um, we're trying to separate out the, the application and then the infrastructure on which that application runs. So the workload, the, the workload swim lane is about the um, how we tell the system to run a particular application or a particular set of binaries that provides some some functionality. Whereas the infrastructure uh, swim lane is about how we tell the system to provision infrastructure to support those workloads. The third, work, the third swim lane is the configuration of those workloads themselves. So um, we can run a, a, a UPF, but there may be different uh, ways in which we want to access it to meet certain user requirements or demands. Um, so we need to configure it in a certain way, uh, typically at runtime after we've deployed it. So those are our three different swim lanes. And the idea here is that we want a uniform way for interacting with all of those. because each of those layers kind of impacts the other. When a set of user requirements comes in, the user doesn't care about any of this. They care about some certain functionality being made available. We know that that means that we need to provision a certain set of capacity on the hardware. We need to set up the node with SRIOV interfaces and with we need to use huge pages and whatever it is. Um, we need to deploy this set of workloads, this set of network functions across these particular clusters. Oh, we need to configure those individual workloads to talk to each other, or maybe later we need to make a change and we want, you know, they have a shared secret. We need to configure multiple workloads at the same time uh, that have a shared, shared secret. So if we have different platforms and different systems um, for doing each of those things, uh, building an automation to do all of that has to understand all these different mechanism and tooling, and humans have to understand them all, and the cognitive load gets very, very high. Um, and the next principle we talked about was declarative management. Now, declarative management's been around for a long time, um, certainly not new with Nephew, and certainly not, not even new with Kubernetes. It, you know, it's a long-standing um, principle, but uh, Kubernetes has been one of the few projects that's done a really good job of actually successfully implementing declarative management in you know, in a particular context. But the idea here, uh, for those who aren't familiar, is that um, rather than sort of starting from a blank slate and telling a system step by step how to get from uh, where it is to where it needs to be, you just tell it where you want it to be and you let the system figure it out. 
So this means that the system can now adjust by measuring the, the, the current state and do only those steps necessary to go from the current state to the, uh, to the intended state. So that's what we mean by intent. And by declare, it means we declare the intent. Our intention is for the state to be this. And that's where we stop. We don't have to tell it, uh, take this step, take this step, take this step, take this step. The system itself has the knowledge and intelligence built in to measure the current state, to understand the intended state that you've told it, and to do that step-by-step -step difference. This is hard, uh, no doubt about it, and um, it requires careful construction of those little units of state, and it, and it requires constraining them to uh, a small piece of the world. Otherwise, the, the sort of combinatorial complexity gets too high. So you really want to make your resources, we call resources, that's how we define state, small enough and understandable enough and limited in scope enough that you can easily build an automation. And then you compose many of these together. And they each work independently, but in coordination through certain, certain sort of uh, um, uh, coordination protocols, which uh, you won't have time to cover today. but. Uh, Certainly in future episodes, we will. So for both of those principles, our solution is Kubernetes everywhere. Um, Kubernetes will provide that declarative intent-based layer for managing all of these different things. Now, as I said earlier, we're not going to rebuild every possible um, 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 existing management platform in Kubernetes controllers. That's not really remotely feasible. But because Kubernetes has a sort of very open, flexible architecture, um, it started with container orchestration, but that's that's really just one example, one use case you can use it for. Um, it's been shown over the last several years with this uh, idea of what we call Kubernetes operators, that we can build automations using the Kubernetes tool set that do this declarative management for many different things. Um, and of course, Kubernetes is widely adopted. It's widely understood by a lot of people. Um, and in fact, there's already solutions built for a number of things uh, that we need, such as um, cloud infrastructure management. Um, there's a number of solutions that, that do that. Um, workloads themselves, of course, we're already talking about running on Kubernetes for many of these workloads. And so um, it's a great starting place and uh, its extensibility and the ecosystem make it a good choice uh, to solve both of these first uh, two principles. So that leaves us with the third one. Um, what do we mean by this um, cooperatively managed machine by machines and humans? Uh, to get understand this a little bit more, I'm going to talk more a little bit in detail about how Kubernetes works. So the desired state in Kubernetes is captured in, in resources. We call them resources, but they're, they're basically, think of them as a, you know, a, a data structure that's uh, just a struct, and um, they're stored in an API server. So most Kubernetes APIs themselves are simply create, read, update, delete of these resources, the vast majority of them. And those set of resources is, is extensible. So there's something called a custom resource definition that allows you to create custom resources. So you can define any schema you want for a resource, and then you can use that create, read, update, delete mechanism, and this other mechanism called watch. So users here, shown on the left, um, either a human through a CLI or through a UI, or a tool through a client library, interacts with the API server and just does those create, read, update, delete of resources. So that the declarative intent is put into a resource, it's stored in the API server, and the user steps away. At that point, there are controllers or actuators running that are watching the API server. And as soon as they see a change in any um, resource that's within their scope uh, they or impacts their you know the, the, their scope their little world 
then they pick up that change, they measure the current state of the world, of their world, and they compare, does the current state of the world look like this intended state? If it doesn't, then they figure out how to make the changes uh, to, to make that happen. So that's just standard Kubernetes. It's extensible, same pattern can be used, uh, same Kubernetes API server can be used, uh, and, and it always follows, follows this pattern. So here's the problem. Um, we've talked about in the last episode that as workloads and even beyond workloads, but topologies of workloads become more complex uh, and, or, the org, you know, and grow at scale, um, you're no longer talking about those folks on the left just managing one resource or a collection of very closely related resources. You're talking about many, many, you know, hundreds or thousands of resources which interrelate in different ways, which manage different parts of that stack. And that stack is understood and owned by different teams and different parts of your organization. So we're no longer in a situation where we just have a user over there who just writes a bunch of manifests and pushes it and they're done. There's no one user that understands that. There's 20 different teams that have to have input to that. And the existing way that the API server works is that as soon as you put it into the API server, it starts actuating. So there's no place for those 20 teams to share draft versions of the resources or for a deployer to come in and say, you know what, I'm gonna to need to deploy something. Uh, in order to do that, I'm gonna need information from you and you and you and you. Right now, that's, that has to be all be done up front in some spreadsheets or something before that deployer can, can do anything. The API server itself would, would begin actuating or wouldn't even validate. Wouldn't even, the, the resources would be considered incomplete. It wouldn't even let you store them. So it all has to be figured out by the users ahead of time. But what if there was a way to, to back that up, to put it in a store like this, where you have a data model in storage that those users can share and interact with before it goes to the API server. You could validate it. You could um, wait t until you know it's complete before you actually write it to the API server. And, and this is really kind of the idea behind GitOps. I mean, GitOps really pioneered this where you're storing now your manifests in Git and everybody can see them and you can use PRs or uh, uh, change requests to modify them and they can be validated with tools. So GitOps, just plain old GitOps without Nephew, does start to get to this concept. The problem is that GitOps is very closely tied to Git, to the underlying storage mechanism, and GitOps doesn't dictate that there's any structure to the contents of that storage and that API server, so uh, that rather that uh, declarative data model. So the idea of um, what we call configuration as data takes that GitOps concept of putting it in storage before it goes to the API server and takes it a step further by separating from the underlying data store. It's no longer just Git, but it's an API, and, per, and, and dictating that the, the data stored has to follow a particular structure. Um, this allows a kind of common language that different clients and different users can all understand uh, as they read out of that API. And since it's API driven, it, it kind of gives you a little bit better concurrency control and ways to coordinate. We talked earlier about Kubernetes controllers have ways to coordinate their um, interaction on a, on a particular, when they're trying to, if there's multiple ones that are trying to actuate some state. Similarly, uh, if we put an API in front of that storage, we can leverage some of those same mechanisms. So what are some of the benefits we get out of that idea? Well, it actually enables, uh, since we're saying it's a well-structured set of data, it enables machine manageable configurations. We no longer have uh, a sort of Turing complete language within our configuration, like when you like you have with a templating system, but instead we have 
tools, uh, we have data that we can operate on with data management techniques. So when we go talk about the in the previous episode, 10 million um, or 20 million different inputs, that dictates the need for data management techniques rather than, than sort of quote code management techniques. Um, one of the sort of other key insights here is that while well, while bundles of research workloads tend to be packaged into sort of uh, bundles or packages that are potentially reusable, each of those packages has um, its own API, right? Like a templating system says, here's a values file, it renders a bunch of manifests, that values file constitutes an API, and every single package, every single chart, for example, has its own API. Since we, we can't look in the chart really itself and see the structure of the data, that's the only API our automations have to work with. With configuration as data, instead we say, no, we're gonna store these as a, a, an understandable machine readable format. This enables something really interesting that while there may be thousands and thousands of charts or packages, there's really orders of magnitude fewer types of resources. So in Kubernetes, we have deployments, we have pods, we have uh, replica sets, we have uh, services. You know, there's there's a handful of very commonly used, you know, a hundred very commonly used resources, whereas there are thousands and thousands of packages. So if we can reduce the order of magnitude of number of APIs, which our automations have to understand, where they can just understand resources, rather than understanding individual packages, we can uh, much more effectively build our automations. As an example, in Nefio, we've built this idea of an IP claim API. Uh, and basically, it allows you to say, um, I want an IP address. Uh, here's a, a, you know, a set of metadata, like site, location, label, region, um, which network it's on, um, whether it's you know v4, v6, whatever it is. Um, that resource can be reused across any package, and the IP address allocation automation will operate on the same way, operate on it in the same manner, regardless of which uh, package it's in. So that's one automation we had to build, rather than having to build an automation that sort of had to understand all the different packages. So that's our approach, and uh, hopefully that helps uh, helps uh, clarify. Um, Looking forward to having you in the community. Thank you.